Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to today's um, Endocrine Grand Rounds. We are very pleased to have um, Dr. Hellman um, from the um, Envirom Institute uh, talk to us today. And Dr. Hellman um, graduated from University of Louisville, obtained his PhD in the physiology and biophysics, uh, also at the University of Louisville. He was a postdoctoral fellow at the uh, uh, Diabetes and Obesity Center, subsequently did a fellowship at um, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and came back to Louisville as assistant professor in the Division of uh, Environmental Medicine um, at the Environ Institute and the Center for Cardiometabolic Science. And um, uh, just this year was promoted uh, with tenure to uh, as associate professor. He has been uh, very active um, in his research field and has been uh, has an R01 um, and also has been a co-investigator um, in a couple of other R01s and is also the um, in one of the core uh, for the P30 grant that they have. Um, he has won several awards during his training and also as a researcher uh, has multiple. Uh, presentations and over 35 publications. Um, he uh, will today talk to us about uh, uh, inflammation and exercise. Uh, welcome, Dr. Hellman. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and also for the, um, the invitation to come and present some of our uh, recent findings. Um, so today I'll be talking about uh, exercising innate immunity uh, to resolve inflammation. So resolution of inflammation is uh, really the interest of my laboratory. Uh, so hopefully today I'll be able to convince you that it's important to understand not only how to resolve inflammation, but the role of specifically lipid mediators in the process. Um, so the overview of the talk today, I'll start off by describing the role of innate immunity and in lipid mediators in a, and their role in acute inflammation and its resolution. Uh, transition into giving a little bit of a background and some previous work uh, that I was involved in looking at defective pro-resolving signaling pathways and in chronic inflammatory diseases such as obesity-induced insulin resistance and diabetic cutaneous wound healing. And then some of the more recent work uh, since coming back to uh, the University of Louisville, looking at the central role of adrenergic signaling and exercise enhanced resolution of acute inflammation. And then uh, finish up by talking about the crosstalk uh, between the adrenal glands and adipose tissue and stimulating pro-resolving lipid mediators uh, in the response to exercise. So first, um, you know, just to make sure that we are all starting from the same uh, perspective here, the, the acute inflammatory response. I'm sorry, I'll close that. Yes, thank you. Um, so the acute inflammatory response um, really is, is initiated within seconds to minutes upon a, an injury or a stimulus. Um, the first you see the formation of edema to help promote or facilitate the recruitment of neutrophils to the site of, of infection. And these PMN infiltrate, they contain any potential microbe or pathogen that may have uh, entered into the system. Upon doing so, they literally spill their guts, right? And natosis and phagocytosis to, to help contain these microbes. They then undergo apoptosis. It must be cleared by the return of these monocyte macrophages. Um, into the into the cavity. Let's see if I can get my cursor over to where you guys are. Yeah. Um, and what's interesting about the acute inflammatory response is that there are lipid mediators, uh, distinct classes of lipid mediators that control these phases of the acute inflammatory response. So initially, upon uh, the formation of edema and the recruitment of PMN, you'll find that the um, the, the site of infection or site of inflammation is dominated by lipids, uh, predominantly prostaglandins and leukotrienes, which obviously prostaglandins are known to vasodilate, again, to help in the recruitment of PMN and neutrophils, whereas the formation of leukotrienes are chemotractants uh, for PMN. Interestingly, as, this, uh, as the neutrophils began, began to apoptose and the macrophages infiltrate, 
to, to help contain these apoptotic PMN. This phase, uh, this resolving phase, is dominated by the pro, uh, by the presence of SPMs, otherwise known as lipoxins, resolvins, protectins, and lorisins. And these uh, lipid mediators represent a novel class of newly described, you know, within the past 20 years, newly described uh, lipid mediators to help resolve uh, an inflammatory response. And I think this is nicely uh, demonstrated here. You can see that the neutrophils swarm uh, very quickly um, to this uh, stimuli, which is then slowly followed by the presence of macrophages in green to help contain these neutrophils and help to remove them after the neutrophils have, have come and, and, and done their job. And so we're really interested in understanding um, you know, how lipid mediators control innate immune responses, because um, we think there might be some therapeutic uh, opportunities there. So uh, I've mentioned SPMs, uh, that stands for the Specialized Pro-Resolving Mediator Superfamily, uh, which is made up of resolvins, protectins, marisins, and lipoxins. And I know this is a somewhat busy slide, but I want to highlight a couple of, of things here. Um, we know that the E-series resolvins are derived from the omega-3 fatty acid EPA um, through the actions of mainly of 5-lipoxygenase, whereas uh, another host of uh, lipid mediators termed the D-series resolvins, as well as the protectins and the marisins in purple here, are derived from uh, omega-3 fatty acid DHA through the actions of 15-lipoxygenase uh, as well as uh, as 5 lipoxygenase, and so hopefully you can appreciate that uh, you know the role of omega three uh, fish oil and the potential to generate some of these uh, SPMs or pro resolving lipid mediators through the actions of these lipoxygenase enzymes. And so um, currently, uh, you know, we haven't worked out all of the signaling mechanisms for each of the SPM, but what we do uh, has come to be realized or appreciated is that uh, resolving E1 elicits its pro-resolving actions uh, through KIMR23, um, but it also serves a antagonistic role on the leukotriene B4 receptor BLT1. So this helps to give you some idea about pro-resolving uh, receptors versus blocking or inhibiting an inflammatory uh, receptor such as BLT1. So this helps describe and kind of put into context the, the regulation and the counterbalances that, that the SPMs uh, can exert their actions on. Um, and so you can see here, I won't go through the whole list, but we've identified uh, the receptor for resolving D1, for instance, uh, which is FPR2, uh, GPR32 in humans. And you can see that they're Actions in the mouse have been described on multiple uh, leukocytes. So really the discovery of this novel class of lipid mediators has challenged a previous dogma of the field that inflammation was basically terminated just through passive processes. That is that the presence of inflammatory mediators just dissipated with time and really kind of brought forth a new idea or a new concept that the resolution of inflammation is, a, is, a, is an active process that's characterized by rapidly turning off uh, the recruitment of neutrophils to sites of inflammation while also stimulating macrophages to phagocytosin to remove these neutrophils during an inflammatory response. So these uh, lipids are not simply anti-inflammatory. They're not just simply blocking the recruitment of neutrophils, but they're also stimulating macrophages to help phagocytose and remove um, noxious stimuli from the, from the system. And so we became interested in looking at the potential role of these lipids, these pro-resolving lipids in the context of insulin resistance, because at the time, around 2008, we we're really starting to emerge this idea that chronic inflammation was central to the development of ins insulin resistance. Um, you know, namely, um, many diabetics would come to the clinic and present with elevated CRP levels, IL-6, uh, increased leukocyte blood counts, all really correlated with insulin resistance. And coupled with uh, some preclinical data that was emerging at that time was, you know, if we knock off, you know, the NF-kappa-B signaling pathway or TLR4 junk or TNF-alpha, so these pro-inflammatory signaling pathways, 
these preclinical models were largely protected against uh, high fat diet induced um, insulin resistance. And the picture that started to emerge uh, was that the adipose tissue, namely, was the source of TNF alpha. And so, um, dear, it, it, lean individuals were characterized by the presence of M2 or anti inflammatory macrophages. But as mice and, and individuals as well gain weight, there's a recruitment of M1 inflammatory macrophages to help really clear, clear up these adipocytes that were dying in response to this excess nutrient overload in this. Um, so um, the idea here was that inc increased release of free fatty acids and storage of ectopic fat to the sites of like skeletal muscle and liver um, would help drive systemic insulin resistance. And so we were really interested in perhaps, you know, maybe this failure of resolution uh, and the idea of promoting resolution may be beneficial in the context of, of insulin resistance due to this chronic inflammatory uh, scenario. So we uh, first took a diabetic mice, which you can appreciate as being obese in the top left corner. Uh, we treated them with a low dose resolving D1 to help promote this pro resolving uh, signaling pathways. And we gave them a uh, IP injection daily uh, for eight days. Uh, on day five, we performed a glucose tolerance test, which didn't show any significant differences. Uh, we saw no difference in glucose except for uh, until we got to day nine of the injection. Uh, subsequently, we found that the home IR score um, was significantly decreased in resolving D1 injected animals. So this suggested to us that Perhaps we're starting to see some improvements, but the simply eight days of treatment may not be enough to reverse the course of this uh, uh, diabetes in the severe model. Um, so we decided to take this out a little bit longer and decided to do two weeks of, of treatment following the same uh, dosing and protocol. And again, we see an improvement in fasting blood glucose at, at day 10. And that was associated with an improvement in the glucose tolerance test. Uh, resolving D1 treated animals had a significantly improved uh, glucose tolerance. And this was also associated with an increase in uh, insulin sensitizing uh, adipokine, adiponectin at both day nine and day 17. So this is really kind of the first evidence uh, to us that suggested that perhaps this chronic inflammation that develops in obese diabetic mice may result as a failure to resolve the inflammation. Okay. Additionally, we found that the uh, adipose tissue of these resolving uh, D1 treated animals had fewer crown-like structures uh, in their visceral adipose tissue. As you can appreciate uh, the quantification at the bottom left-hand part of your screen at both day nine and day 17. And this is important because we know that these inflammatory macrophages that are recruited to the adipose tissue localize around these dying adipocytes and form these what are called uh, crown-like structures. Um, you can see uh, by the dark staining the presence of these uh, leukocytes in the adipose tissue are largely diminished uh, in, the, in the RVD1 treated animals. Um, we characterize the presence of these um, M1 pro-inflammatory macrophages, and we found that the RVD1 treated animals um, had fewer of the pro-inflammatory, but increased levels of the M2 anti-inflammatory macrophages. Um, this was also associated with an improvement in uh, phospho AKT levels in response to insulin uh, in the adipose tissue. So that was that was interesting to us, and we were really um, you know, excited by these findings, and we were wondering if perhaps the actual resolution kinetics were altered uh, in this diabetic model. You know, simply just adding resolving D1 to promote resolution uh, was exciting, but really are the resolution kinetics um, different in this model? So for this, uh, to answer this question, we utilize a, uh, a well-known model or well-established model in the field, which is a zymazine-induced peritonitis model where we can really track this acute inflammatory response. So this model has several um, advantages. It's self-limited so that we can actually study the resolution response to acute inflammation. 
uh, we can easily access uh, leukocytes that are trafficking into the area without having to do you know tissue digestion uh, and kind of laborious uh, um, kind of sample preps. It also allows us to measure lipid mediators at the same time so that we can associate changes in lipid mediators with the leukocyte trafficking. And it's relatively short, so we can um, make all these measurements in, in mice uh, within a week or two. And so as an example uh, of this, you can really see the, the flow cytometry here looking at F480 positive macrophages versus Ly6G. So there's largely no neutrophils present uh, in the cavity uh, at zero hours, and it's predominantly uh, macrophages. But upon zymazine treatment, you see a, a, a pretty exaggerated neutrophilic response, which is then slowly resolved by the return of these macrophages to the cavity and the disappearance or removal of these uh, infiltrated neutrophils. And again, I just want to remind you that these uh, different phases of the acute inflammatory response are dominated um, by different lipid mediator classes. So early on during the inflammatory response, prostaglandins and leukotrienes dominate whereas later on the resolvents and the SPMs um, start to um, take over. And this is really um, you know, an important concept uh, moving forward uh, through the talk. Additionally, this well-established model allowed us to quantify um, the resolution indices. So we can uh, use this model to quantify potential differences in, in resolution kinetics. So using the, uh, the wild type and DVDV mice, uh, what we first noticed is that the uh, neutrophils, the recruitment wasn't really different um, between wild type and DBDB mice. Um, however, during resolution or 48 hours after zymazan, the wild type animals were able to remove uh, these neutrophils, whereas the diabetic mice had a significantly elevated or um, the, the, the neutrophils remained in the, in the tissue longer. And these neutrophils um, were also a next uh, five positive, meaning that they're apoptotic, but they're not being removed um, despite um, similar levels of macrophages uh, compared to the wild type animals. And so we assessed macrophage phagocytic capacity in wild type and, and diabetic mice, and we found that the uptake of Fitzy labeled zymazan uh, was largely devoid and uh, um, uh, defected in the macrophages isolated from DVDV mice. But interestingly, if we treat these macrophages with 0.1 nanomolar resolving D1, we could restore uh, to some degree their phagocytic capacity. Again, suggesting that this, these pro-resolving lipids may be important um, for restoring uh, macrophage phagocytic um, function. We went on in this publication from 2013 to kind of um, uh, mechanistically, we, we found that potentially free fatty acids may be involved in inhibiting diabetic macrophage phagocytosis. Here we treated um, uh, macrophages in vitro with palmitate conjugated with BSA, and we found that the palmitate uh, largely inhibited uh, the phagocytic uptake of Fitzy labeled zymazine. Hopefully you can appreciate the, uh, the lack of little green dots there on the right-hand column. And this seemed to be dose dependent of palmitate. This is percent inhibition um, uh, per dose of palmitate. And that's the uh, quantification of the phagocytosis. And so in these macrophages, what we ended up finding was that the, um, the, the expression of PTGS2 or COX2 uh, was elevated um, in response to the palmitate treatment. Um, this is both the um, mRNA level and also at the uh, protein level, uh, as well as the presence of COX-2 product, prostaglandin E2 and prostaglandin D2 are elevated, suggesting again that palmitate treatment is increasing COX-2 expression and the production of prostaglandins. And interestingly, if we treat uh, macrophages uh, directly with prostaglandin E2 or D2, we can inhibit uh, their phagocytic capacity. So with that understanding, we went back in vivo and uh, using a dexamethasone-induced thymocyte apoptosis uh, uh, model, um, we found that upon dexamethasone treatment, there's an accumulation of uh, T3 
tunnel positive or apoptotic thymocytes. Um, and you can see the quantification here on the right. The number of tunnel positive cells is elevated in the DBDB mice, similar to what we saw with our peritonitis model. However, if we block uh, prostaglandin receptors uh, using H6809, we can reverse or diminish the accumulation of these uh, tunnel positive thymocytes. Again, suggesting that prostaglandins are playing an inhibitory role in uh, macrophage phagocytosis of removal uh, of, of dead or apoptotic um, of cells. So this kind of led to the uh, concept that, um, you know, that during normal acute inflammatory responses, PMN infiltrate the undergo apoptosis and are effectively removed by macrophages. However, in, in diabetic and uh, diabetes, this process is really disturbed um, and inhibited, um, and we think that free fatty acids uh, may be causal here. Interestingly, around the same time, we came across a paper that showed essentially a similar phenomenon. So hopefully you can um, see here GR1 uh, staining or the Western blood. So GR1 is a marker for neutrophils. And you can see at 13 days, I think even uh, yeah, seven days, there's uh, still the presence of GR1 in the cutaneous wounds of diabetic mice um, that is already resolved in, in wild type animals. Again, this is another model that's kind of suggesting that there's defective macrophage uh, removal of, of neutrophils. Um, so we wanted to study this a little bit more in depth. So we uh, generated a excisional cutaneous skin wound model in mice. Um, and just walk you through the generation of this model here a little bit. Basically what we do is we uh, remove any fur from the animal and we create uh, using a five millimeter punch, a full cutaneous thick, um, a uh, full thickness cutaneous wound on the back of these mice. Um, we then splint um, these wounds using silicone uh, splints. Um, this allows the wound to heal um, more like humans do right from the inside out and not simply uh, looking at the contraction of wounds, uh, which is what happens typically in rodents. That's how they uh, will, will heal a little differently. So we employed this model of splinting to more um, uh, to adapt or to model more of the human context. And what's nice about this is it allows us to measure the re-epithelialization rate uh, in the same animals uh, simply by imaging uh, the wounds. So using this model, uh, we were able to, you know, to no surprise really, to find that DBDB or diabetic mice have delayed wound healing uh, compared to wild type uh, counterparts. Um, but more interestingly, what kind of emerged here is that performing lipidomics uh, using uh, LC-MSMS, what we found is that the pathway, intermediate pathways for some of the SPMs, uh, namely the marisins, the protectants, and the resolvents, so 14-HDHA and 17-HDHA was significantly down-regulated in the wounds of diabetic mice, um, suggesting that perhaps, again, if we can restore resolution, um, you know, could we enhance the, the wound healing in these diabetic animals? And so we tested that by, again, using our same uh, full thickness excisional wound model, and we simply added Resolve and D1 topically to these wounds um, or saline uh, controls. And hopefully you could appreciate the shift left or the improvement in the uh, wound closure rate of, of diabetic mice that were treated with Resolve and D1. Additionally, we performed histology and was able to uh, uh, see that the the wounds of resolving D1 treated animals had a full had a fuller thickness and uh, thicker granulation tissue, suggesting a more mature uh, wound in addition to uh, increased uh, closure. Um, we also looked at the presence of tunnel positive uh, cells uh, in in these wounds, and found that resolving treated uh, wounds had significantly less tunnel positive staining. Uh, compared to the saline um, diabetic mice. Uh, we went on to further extend these findings and, and really we're curious to know if maybe SPMs may be important for just normal wound healing in wild type uh, animals, um, given that the typical uh, wound healing response involves an inflammatory response. Uh, first, we started uh, looking at wild type mice and 
treated them with either resolving D1, resolving D4, or resolving D2 topically um, right after um, uh, the wound creation. And again, was able to demonstrate or see that uh, SPM treatment enhanced uh, the closure and the reepithelialization of these full thickness wounds. Um, and we think that these actions were largely due to direct actions on uh, keratinocytes given the uh, receptor uh, expression level here. Um, additionally, these actions um, were receptor mediated. So for here, resolving D2 uh, treatment on GPR18, so that's the uh, receptor that's been identified for resolving D2. So those animals uh, do not see an enhanced uh, closure rate compared to wild type animals treated with the resolving T2. Additionally, uh, FPR2 knockout animals, which is the receptor for resolving D1, show a decrease in the closure rate um, compared to wild type animals. So the, the story or the, the concept that was really emerging here, it was that there's it seems like in these inflammatory models, there's a failure to resolve. And this isn't only borne out by our studies, but there's been numerous other studies in the field looking at the role of other SPMs and other model inflammatory disease models. Um, this is really a, an abbreviated list of what's been uh, published so far. But, I, you know, I wanted to spare you from uh, each individual uh, paper, um, but Suffice it to say, there's been studies in, in other inflammatory preclinical models, as well as in human study, inflammatory uh, disease models in, in humans that also kind of bear out this, again, this concept that there's a failure in these SPMs and the ability to resolve in chronic inflammation. So when coming back to the university, I was kind of, you know, kind of, kind of juggling these ideas around and trying to... Um, you know, really wanted to know, you know, can SPM production and resolution be restored without exogenous synthetic drug delivery? You know, is it, is it that this pathway, once it's inhibited, um, it's gone? Or are there other ways that we could start to intervene? And from a basic science standpoint, I thought that that might provide additional mechanistic insights and in trying to understand how these pathways are, are controlled and regulated. And so we became interested in exercise uh, because exercise, as we all know, is pleiotropic, uh, exerts uh, health benefits. It, it seems like it, almost every disease, um, but yet the mechanisms aren't really well understood. So um, what kind of what I wanted to highlight here was that we know with exercise, uh, there's a stimulation of the HPA, of the sympath uh, sympathetic adrenal medullary axis, um, which obviously acts on the adrenal glands to reduce or to produce and secrete adrenaline or epinephrine as well as cortisol, which has been shown to inhibit the production of TNF alpha uh, in circulating monocytes. We also know that uh, with exercise, skeletal muscle releases uh, IL 6, which has now been termed a myokine. Um, and the release of IL 6 is dose and intensity uh, uh, dependent with exercise. And that also, um, despite being a canonical um, pro-inflammatory cytokine, has been shown to decrease TNF-alpha and stimulate the production of IL-10 uh, in macrophages as well as IL-1 receptor uh, antagonist cytokine in, in macrophages. Additionally, exercise has been shown to decrease the presence of inflammatory or M1 macrophages in the adipose tissue while also stimulating or enhancing the presence of M2 anti-inflammatory macrophages. Additionally, there's effects on lymphoid uh, organs and, and on T cells um, and a whole host of other um, you know, uh, infl inflammatory uh, mediators in response to exercise. So again, we went back to our, our well-established model of peritonitis and wanted to know if exercise may uh, alter uh, resolution kinetics. So to do this, we use a model of forced treadmill running, where we subject mice to 75% uh, of their max capacity five days a week for four weeks uh, with an increasing duration. And by the end of the fourth week, uh, mice, are, um, their exercise capacity is significantly enhanced, um, suggesting that there's an adaptation to exercise. 
And so using this model, we then subjected animals uh, to, parito to zymosan induced peritonitis so that we can again measure these uh, leukocyte uh, kinetics. And interestingly, what we found was that uh, despite having a mean increase in the recruitment of neutrophils at the peak of the inflammatory response, <laughs> neutrophils were more readily uh, removed from the cavity of exercised animals compared to sedentary controls here that you can see in, in light gray. And so calculating the resolution indices uh, basically led to um, that the exercised animal saw an improvement of approximately seven hours or a 30% enhancement, roughly 30% enhancement uh, of resolution uh, in response to Zynozam. And similar to before, this was despite um, really no change in the abundance of macrophages coming into the peritoneal cavity to help remove these dying neutrophils. Um, interestingly, we did uh, observe an increase in exercise animals of the SBM resolve in D1, as well as the biosynthetic gene, or the biosynthetic enzymes, ALOX15 and ALOX5. So we went on, um, and, and we we're really curious that despite having the similar levels of macrophages in the cavity, the removal of these neutrophils was enhanced. So we uh, treated uh, ex vivo, we treated um, macrophages isolated from exercise or sedentary control mice uh, to FITSI labeled Zymazan and assess their uptake. And we found that the macrophage phagocytic capacity was enhanced um, when the macrophages were isolated from uh, animals that had undergone uh, exercise. Additionally, these macrophages uh, produced more resolve in D1 um, in, in the peritoneal cavity. So we went on um, again in this public publication to show that um, you know th there was an important role for epinephrine. So I'll, I'll save you guys about two years of, of fishing, looking for different cytokines that may be involved or uh, different other signaling uh, molecules. And we settled on um, epinephrine because we know epinephrine, again, in a dose and intensity dependent manner uh, is released uh, in, in during exercise. And we treated, um, macrophages in a dish with increasing concentrations of epinephrine and noted an increase in the in the release of resolve in D1 uh, in a dish. And interestingly, we also found an elevation or an increase in the expression of 15 lipoxygenase, which is one of the important biosynthetic enzymes uh, for making SPMs. And this epinephrine induced uh, upregulation or an increase in uh, 15 LOX1 was blocked when cells were pretreated with the alpha-1 adrenergic receptor antagonist prazosin, uh, but not when cells were pretreated with the beta-1, beta-2 antagonist IC-I118 or 551 or um, betaxolol, suggesting that alpha-1 may be important for mediating this epinephrine-induced effect. Additionally, we found if we pretreat cells with prazosin, we can we can block the epinephrine-induced production of resolving D1 uh, in these macrophages. To test this further, um, we used phenylephrine, which is an alpha-1 agonist. Uh, what, what we were able to, to see there with alpha-1 uh, alpha agonism was an enhancement in macrophage phagocytosis and an increase in resolving D1. Um, and the phagocytic response to alpha-1 stimulation uh, was blocked uh, when cells were pretreated uh, with ML351, which is an inhibitor of the 15 lipoxygenase enzyme, suggesting that alpha-1 stimulation is increasing macrophage phagocytosis via stimulating 15 lipoxygenase. So this was uh, all in vitro. Um, so we we're curious to, to see if this mechanism, potential mechanism, um, bared out uh, in vivo. So we took another cohort of animals and subjected them to our four weeks of, of exercise. And again, our peritonitis uh, model. And what we found is that animals treated with uh, the alpha-1 antagonists um, show a delay in the removal of these PMN compared to exercise uh, treated with a saline control. Again, suggesting that alpha-1 may be important for exercise-enhanced uh, resolution. Um, this is the quantification of, of leukocytes in the cavity. Um, 
And you can see here that with exercise, again, we got a significant decrease uh, in the neutrophils with exercise, and, um, and that was largely inhibited, that was significantly inhibited by the presence or the treatment with alpha-1 antagonism. Additionally, the, the production of resolving D1, uh, exercise-induced production of RVD1 was blocked uh, when animals were treated with uh, prazosin. Additionally, the phagocytosis of opsonized or IgG-coated latex beads uh, was blocked uh, when animals were treated with, with prazosin. So this really kind of demonstrated to us um, that upon exercise and the release of epinephrine, that alpha-1 uh, stimulation results in the upregulation or the increased expression of 15 lipoxygenase in macrophages, leading to enhancement and resolving D1 and the removal or ferrocytosis of neutrophils, uh, thus stimulating resolution of inflammation. Um, and so we were really excited about this. We were able to, to get some funding uh, to help support this project. And, you know, what kind of bared from there was that, OK, well, that's interesting. This is all in the peritoneal cavity. Does this, does this uh, type of mechanism or does this mechanism, is it also in play in other uh, sites? And also, is it dietary dependent? Um, so we were really interested in, the, in understanding the intersection um, of, of diet and exercise here, given our previous data looking at high fat fed animals and obese animals having a, a delay in resolution. And so to study um, the dietary dependence, we subjected animals to a low fat or high fat diet for uh, a total of six weeks. Um, and then for four of those weeks, we, we subjected them to forced treadmill models. So it's a total of six weeks of diet, dietary intervention, and then four weeks of concurrent uh, exercise intervention or not. Um, and I apologize for it being so small here. I'll try to walk through. This is uh, bas basically the exercise adaptation uh, on low-fat diet and high-fat diet. And you can see that Animals on low-fat diet after four weeks of exercise are able to significantly improve the, the amount of distance that they run during exercise capacity test and the amount of work that they're able to perform. And putting mice on six weeks of this high-fat diet really didn't have any uh, alterations in their ability to adapt to exercise. So their ability to run uh, or increase their, their distance to, uh, to run as well as their ability to perform work it was not any different from the low fat uh, control counterparts. During exercise capacity tests and the, uh, the measurement of lactate release at the fatigue point uh, was not different between low fat fed and high fat fed animals. Uh, we did measure a inhibition of weight gain in our exercise animals fed high fat diet compared to high fat fed sedentary animals. Um, and there was a uh, postprandial uh, increase in high fat fed sedentary animals, which was significantly reduced uh, in animals that were exercised. Interestingly, though, fasting blood glucose levels were not uh, affected uh, by their exercise or high fat diet. Um, animals that undergo exercise or uh, increase their lean mass while decreasing their fat mass. And again, that was not different uh, between low fat diet or high fat diet. And there is no significant differences uh, glucose tolerance or insulin tolerance tests. So this is really a, um, this is not a high fat diet induced adipose tissue inflammation model. This is really just looking at the dietary dependence of, of exercise and more or less a susceptibility um, model than it is looking at an adipose tissue inflammation or metabolic syndrome model. This is a very, uh, very acute uh, model of high fat diet feeding in mice. So uh, looking at the adipose tissue, the first thing that we observed was there's again an, an increase, uh, just like in our peritonitis model, there was an increase in the expression of ALOX15 in our control animals undergoing exercise, which was blocked by animals that were fed high fat diet. Additionally, we found uh, in, in our control animals that exercise upregulated the presence of, of SPM resolving D1, uh, ATRVD1, RVD4, and ATRVD3, all of which were um, blocked uh, when animals also consumed high fat diet while exercising. 
And these changes were associated with um, a blockade in the exercise induced upregulation of CD301 expressing macrophages, which are uh, anti inflammatory M2 macrophages. So, so from these data alone, it suggested to us that short duration high fat diet feeding is blocking exercise induced uh, pro resolving response, at least in the adipose tissue. Uh, we were curious to, to kind of tease out. Um, this upregulation of ALOX15 uh, and the whole adipose tissue measurement that we that we have here, and so we we separated out the adipocyte fraction uh, from what's called the stromovascular fraction um, from the visceral adipose, and performed PCR for ALOX15, ALOX5, the receptor for resolving D1 FPR2, as well as the metabolizing enzyme HPGD, and what we found is that it was the SVF fraction. Um, that demonstrated an, an increase in ALOX15 expression uh, upon uh, exercise training. Um, really no significant uh, increases in the adipocyte fraction. But as we know from literature, the SVF is comprised of macrophages, T-cells, neutrophils, stem cells, and endothelial cells. It's still a, a mixture uh, a fraction. And so we teased or we performed magnetic bead sorting uh, for F480 positive cells. So these are macrophages um, and really we were able to get approximately about 80% uh, purity. And we found that it was the F480 positive fraction um, that demonstrated upregulation of ALOX15 with exercise uh, as opposed to the F480 negative fraction, which showed no significant difference uh, in ALOX15 expression. And this um, was blocked, uh, this upregulation of ALOX15 in the F480 fraction was blocked in animals that consumed high fat diet. So uh, from these data, uh, and then what we had previously published showing the role of epinephrine um, in exercise stimulated ALOX15 expression, we turned to the adrenal gland to see if there may be some uh, gross histological differences uh, with this high fat diet feeding and, and really there was none um, to report at least um, with the naked eye. Um, but upon performing PCR and immunoblotting, we found that the expression of PNMT or uh, phenylethanolamine and methyltransferase in the adrenal gland, um, both at the PCR or the mRNA level was decreased with high fat diet feeding as well as at the protein level. Um, which was not rescued uh, in animals that were subjected to exercise. Additionally, uh, we see an increase in epinephrine in the urine of animals uh, fed low fat diet that undergo exercise uh, that was blocked uh, in animals that uh, consumed high fat diet, suggesting that high fat diet is inhibiting um, the adrenal medulla uh, from releasing epinephrine in response to exercise perhaps at the level of regulating PNMT uh, expression. Uh, so we sought to, to see if adding epinephrine back to high fat uh, fed mice following uh, the same protocol, the same feeding protocol as before, may rescue uh, the, the, ex, you know, the high fat diet induced blockade of, of SPMs. And so um, again, I apologize for it being a little blurry and small, um, essentially, what we did is again, we fed um, mice high fat diet um, for six weeks and then treated them during the last week with uh, epinephrine or not, and then looked at the macrophage content in the adipose tissue. And uh, what you could appreciate is that epinephrine treatment uh, stimulated the recruitment of macrophages to the adipose tissue. This is consistent with the literature showing that. Macrophage recruitment to the adipose tissue is important for buffering free fatty acids. Um, so this has been shown in, for cold exposure or in fasting models. Um, and interestingly, what we found is that epinephrine stimulated the recruitment of M1 as well as the formation of M2 macrophages. So this is slightly different than what we were seeing uh, with exercise alone. However, we also had a third group that we treated with ML351, right? So this is the 15-lipoxygenase uh, inhibitor. And what we found is that 15-lipoxygenase inhibition did not block epinephrine-induced recruitment of macrophages. 
um, but it led to the enhancement of M1 macrophages and the reduction of epinephrine-induced M2 macrophages. So this suggests that epinephrine-induced M2 macrophage content in the adipose tissue is dependent upon 15 lipoxygenase uh, activity. Um, so this suggests that epinephrine may be, uh, or it is necessary for driving M2 macrophages formation in the adipose tissue, uh, but it's not sufficient. And we think that the SPMs are important at the tissue level for controlling the polarization and the formation of anti-inflammatory uh, M2 macrophages. Um, additionally, we know from literature that uh, inflammatory macrophages primarily derive their ATP um, from glycolysis um, and actually exhibit a break in the TCA cycle with the accumulation of citrate and succinate, whereas M2 macrophages uh, primarily derive their ATP uh, via mitochondrial respiration and, and TCA. So we're curious to try to kind of understand how or whether SPMs may be controlling M2 macrophage uh, polarization by changing their intermediary metabolism. Um, and so first what we wanted to look at is specifically this marker that we keep using uh, to identify M2 macrophages, CD301. Is it, its expression in macrophages uh, linked or coupled uh, with uh, changes in intermediary metabolism. So to study this, we took, uh, we plated bone marrow macrophages and we treated them with IL-4 to promote fatty acid oxidation and the formation of M2 macrophages. And we treated them with either uh, BSA palmitate and or uh, the uh, edamoxier. Edamoxier is a CPT1 inhibitor, which is the rate limiting step for fatty acid oxidation and mitochondrial uh, respiration. And we performed flow cytometry to then look at uh, CD301 expression. And so hopefully you could appreciate that, um, you know, consistent with the literature, uh, we see an upregulation of CD301 or M2 marker with the treatment of IL-4. But this is uh, significantly enhanced further when we add palmitate uh, to the cell culture media. In this induction, uh, in this increase uh, in CD301 expression with palmitate, was largely inhibited when uh, cells were pretreated with a CPT1 inhibitor at amoxia, suggesting that CD301 expression is directly coupled uh, to fatty acid oxidation uh, in macrophages. Um, and so, as jumping around a little bit here, but uh, we went back then in, in, in vivo and we were questioning whether uh, SPMs may be important for driving. Uh, perhaps they're increasing uh, the presence of M2 and CD301 by stimulating fatty acid oxidation. And so um, due to some technical um, limitations, we're not able to isolate uh, macrophages directly, uh, perform uh, these metabolic assays. But we did take the adipose tissue SVF and cultured it with um, palmitate or not, and then treated them with a resolving D1. And what we found is that the oxygen consumption rate as, as assessed by uh, seahorse extracellular flux analysis, it was elevated um, by the presence of, of resolving D1, um, both basally uh, as well as the max oxygen consumption, as well as the ATP length, uh, suggesting that, uh, you know, resolving D1 stimulates fatty acid oxidation, uh, at least in the adipose tissue uh, stromal vascular fraction. We do think it's the macrophages uh, are responding. Um, we see here an elicited macrophages treated with either uh, palmitate um, or oleate, and we see uh, resolving D1 and resolving D4 both stimulates oxygen consumption or mitochondrial respiration is enhanced um, in these uh, elicited macrophages treated um, with 15 lipoxygenase derived SPMs. And we also think that the actions of resolving D1 um, are receptor mediated. Um, we see here that uh, FPR2 positive macrophages, I'm going a little bit long here, so I'll kind of speed up. Um, FPR2 positive macrophages, so this is the receptor for resolving D1. Uh, we see an increase again in, in mitochondrial respiration. And this was, is completely uh, inhibited uh, or non-existent in FPR2 
uh, knock out um, macrophages. Again, just suggesting that the mitochondrial respiration that's induced by resolvent D1 is, is receptor mediated. We also, um, uh, a very talented graduate student in my lab, Ernesto Pina Calderon, uh, was able to tease out the, the role of AMPK in, in this process. And what he was able to, to, to elucidate was that uh, the actions of resolving uh, D1, uh, resolving uh, E1 and Marisen 1 uh, were AMPK uh, dependent uh, because pretreatment with compound C, an inhibitor of AMPK activity, uh, blocked the induction of mitochondrial respiration. This was unique, uh, however, because the resolving D2, despite increasing uh, respiration, did not um, seem to be sensitive to compound C treatment. So we think that there might be uh, distinct signaling pathways um, that these SPMs are, are undergoing or partaking in that uh, then stimulate uh, mitochondrial respiration. Um, and so all of that um, uh, was very interesting. And we found, you know, all of that was in basic uh, preclinical models and mouse models. Um, and we were interested to know if perhaps this translates uh, at all. So we, we haven't gotten there yet um, to test these endpoints directly, but what, what we have been able to do um, in collaboration uh, with Daniel Riggs and the Environment Institute, um, who's an uh, epidemiologist, biostats um, guru, um, using the NHANES uh, cohort, we're able to uh, kind of look at how um, changes in, with cardiorespiratory fitness or VO2 max, as well as changes in fatty acid, um, plasma levels of free fatty acids and uh, C-reactive protein uh, augment um, or, or, or related. And so using um, data from NHANES, uh, we were able to recapitulate what's known in the literature, and that is that uh, as VO2 max or cardiorespiratory fitness is enhanced, there's typically a decrease in systemic in inflammation uh, as we assessed here uh, by the levels of CRP. Um, but what was interesting about this analysis is that we found that um, individuals that had uh, medium levels of omega-3 fatty acids had an enhancement in this negative association, meaning Individuals with omega-3 fat, medium levels of omega-3 fatty acids had an, an enhanced decrease in CRP for a given unit of VO2 max. And, and this was uh, not the case, an individual, uh, as it relates to uh, levels of saturated fatty acids or monounsaturated fatty acids. But specifically, it was the omega-3 fatty acids that were enhancing this negative uh, relationship. And in particular, um, it was alpha linoleic acid um, and decosa hexanoic acid, or DHA, that were directly uh, responsible for enhancing this negative uh, association between cardiorespiratory fitness and systemic inflammation. So this is not direct evidence that exercise is enhancing resolution of inflammation uh, in humans, but um, it's a step closer uh, than uh, we do have some preliminary data uh, in humans. We have some skeletal biopsies from individuals undergoing uh, cycling. Um, and we see there seems to be an increasing trend in the expression of 15 lipoxygenase upon six weeks of exercise. Additionally, um, we see elevation in the plasma levels immediately after exhaustive exercise of lipoxin A4 and 15R uh, lipoxin A4, which are both uh, SPMs. And this is consistent, these changes in, uh, in these SPMs are also consistent with um, a couple or three papers in the literature that also showed that upon um, immediately after um, exhaustive and aerobic exercise, there's an increase in the presence of LXA4 in the urine. As well in the study by Jez Dali in Nature Medicine showed that uh, the presence of the 13 series resolvents uh, is elevated uh, upon exercise. And interestingly, in the study by Markworth, they looked at the levels of, uh, of SPMs in response to exercise and in individuals taking ibuprofen. And what you can appreciate is that individuals taking ibuprofen and then undergoing exercise do not see the, uh, the same uh, induction of SPMs 
um, in response to exercise. Um, so if you take your inset and then you go exercise, you may not be reaping all of the rewards. And so um, what we're doing now or in the future is, you know, we really want to see if this, uh, what we found in the basic models will really translate. And so, um, and, and to see if these changes are associated with changes in overall immunity and, um, and collaboration um, with Sean Heffron at NYU, um, we were, we're undergoing, I think we enrolled the first participant last week in the PERSPIRE trial. Uh, so PERSPIRE pro-resolving and pro-inflammatory responses to acute exhaustive exercise in healthy individuals. And we're really excited uh, about this uh, opportunity to, to see if what we found in these preclinical models translates. So in this study, we'll, we'll perform um, three blood draws in the, when the participant visits. Um, we'll have them undergo a cardiopulmonary exercise test. We'll do a blood draw immediately afterwards. Uh, we'll wait four hours. We'll do another blood draw. And then we'll subject them to three months of uh, intense exercise training. And after those three months, we'll invite them back uh, and we'll, we're, we'll repeat those same uh, blood draws uh, before and after cardiopulmonary exercise tests. And we'll, we'll do an exhaustive uh, immunophenotyping on these individuals. We'll look at the per, uh, production of SPMs and how it relates to changes um, in immune cell circulation and, and function. And so uh, we're really excited uh, about, the, about this. So um, again, I apologize for being a little bit long-winded, um, but I'll try to wrap it up here. So in summary, uh, obesity-induced insulin resistance uh, is associated with a delayed resolution of inflammation and dysfunctional macrophage phagocytosis. And promoting resolution uh, improves insulin sensitivity and decreases fasting blood glucose levels in preclinical uh, models. Additionally, uh, apoptotic cell clearance and diabetic wound healing uh, is stimulated by topical uh, resolving D1 treatment. Um, some of the newer data uh, suggests that exercise enhanced macrophage phagocytosis and resolution of inflammation is dependent on adrenergic uh, stimulation. Um, and we think that these actions are, are related to uh, the uh, stimulation of SPMs uh, and their ability to promote fatty acid oxidation and mitochondrial respiration uh, via AMPK. And so this long um, kind of um, understanding in the field is that exercise was an anti-inflammatory activity, but we hope in the future that we can um, kind of change that idea and that exercise is actually a pro-resolving activity, which has different implications than just simply being anti-inflammatory. And so with that, I'd like to uh, thank um, people in my lab and in the Institute, in particular, um, Ernesto Pina Calderon. You see this uh, really fancy photo um, of him, um, but he, he, he's really, uh, he's done uh, really, really good things and difficult assays in the lab. So I'd like to acknowledge his efforts. In addition, uh, Jenny, uh, who's been in the lab, uh, since 2016, and she, she's kind of the, you know, the go-to person in the lab, as well as uh, Dr. Nolan Boyd, who recently joined us, who does a lot, all of our uh, LCMSMS analysis. Uh, also, I'd like to thank other people um, in the center, as well as uh, external uh, collaborators and funding sources. So um, I was told that I should let you guys know what today's event code is, and with that, I will take any questions. Yes, sir. The effects of the high fat diet uh, is is that because of the fat per se, or because the animals get fatter and cause chronic response? So the data that we have suggests that the high fat diet is blocking exercise stimulated epinephrine release at the level of the adrenal. Per, per se. The influx of fat, and it's not related to the animals getting more adipose We actually don't even see an influx of fat in the adrenal gland. Is okay. that what you're implying? That the influx of fat in the it adrenal? Seems it seems to be independent of that. So we're looking now at um, changes in glucocorticoid receptors. So the glucocorticoids are known to regulate the expression of uh, PNMT, the enzyme that converts norepinephrine to epinephrine in the adrenal medulla. Um, and so we're, we're 
we're undergoing studies now to try to tease out exactly how high fat is blocking that uh, expression at, at the adrenal medulla. And even in those, you get high levels of circulating uh, resolvents. Is it just a local phenomenon when you have a boom, or is it more systemic? So, so it seems to be. So, the production of the SPM seems to um, be really, uh, I wouldn't say isolated, but it seems to be enhanced, or it, it mainly occurs at the site of inflammation. So, we don't see um, large circulating levels of SPMs in the plasma. Now, with exercise, we do see an increase um, above baseline in, in some of the resolvents and then a decrease in others. So, but we think because they're the, you know, they're, they're active at such low nanomolar concentrations that really it makes more sense actually that they're that the abundance of them and the levels of them are higher at the tissue level where you would see inflammation, um, right? So, um, but with exercise specifically, um, we do see some changes in the plasma, uh, but we think it's more tissue or site specific. Yeah. How long does it take after exercise? to go down yeah we uh, all of these uh studies we collect um 24 hours after their last bout of exercise um and we haven't we haven't really looked to see how long does it take uh for it to return back to baseline we've done kind of the opposite how much exercise does it take to stimulate um and it does seem to be about three to four weeks of, of exercise to stimulate uh, the production of SPMs. Um, but yeah, the return back to baseline, uh, I guess, in decompensation, um, yeah, we're not sure. Yeah, that's an important point, though. I see a difference with the diabetics. Um, in, in, in exercise, in stimulate. Oh, with exercise. Well, so we've only done short duration high fat. We haven't studied uh, frank diabetes yet to see if uh, those animals uh, may respond differently or not. Um, you know, the mechanisms there might be completely different. Um, so we're not sure there, you know, the, there might be some modest weight loss in those animals. And so that, that was actually a reason that we avoided doing that because that could complicate the interpretation of what we were seeing. Um, but those are definitely uh, experiments that were planning to do we just we started with the trying to understand what happens with just uh, high fat diet feeding before we have frank diabetes uh, but definitely important yeah uh, so could I ask you a question? sure uh, and that is do you see differences in different degrees of exercise like does some degree of exercise printing go on um you, i mean you know i may be getting too uh detailed no, not at all, not at all. So we know that epinephrine release is in response to exercise is dependent on the intensity of exercise and the duration that's being performed. So we haven't tested it directly, but I, I would, I would think that you know if you, you know, run these animals are running at seventy five percent of their max capacity. So it, it's moderate to high intensity. I'm sorry. Oh, I said they really go go. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, I, I, you know, if you run at 40, 50 percent max capacity, will we see the same effect? Maybe not. Yeah, uh, because if, if epinephrine is really critical here, then uh, we may not see that effect. Now, let me see if I can figure out how to get here to the chat. I hope I didn't turn. I think I got it. Does endorphin increase during exercise have any influence on resolution? <sighs> Good question. Um, I, I don't know uh, directly. I can speculate here uh, if you'll allow me to. Um, but um, one of the endorphins is actually um, uh, recognizes uh, a receptor that one of the SPMs also binds to. So the, we don't know is the answer uh, to the question, but I said I think perhaps there may be a plausible um, 
uh, it may actually be that endorphins uh, may have a pro-resolving effect, but um, to my knowledge, no one has looked directly at, at the role of endorphins. Uh, next question, how is Resolvin overexpressed for lab experiment? Is it possible to administer Resolvin to rapidly heal wound complications from diabetes? Um, so if you're talking about our, um, our wound healing and our diabetes uh, models, uh, we gave Resolvins, uh, it was an intraperitoneal injection. Um, and and we did not add, we did not treat animals with the resolvents uh, in any of the uh, exercise uh, experiments. And is it possible to administer resolvent to rapidly heal wound complication uh, from diabetes? Yeah, I mean the studies that we performed, it was the uh, resolvent D one was treated topically. So um, yes, yes, yeah, so you can you can uh, treat rapidly, uh, which we think is one of the advantages. Um, uh, we have some ideas about um, maybe taking that a step further and, and, and looking at um, some some newer ways to administer the SPMs in, in wound healing models. Um, and I think that's all the questions. Are there any more in the audience? So in any way, they believe like they're talking to TNF or any of the other side effects? So, um, so yeah, so so typically these pro-inflammatory cytokines obviously are elevated during inflammation, and that's when we see resolvins are down-regulated in vivo. Now, if you treat animal or treat cells in a dish um, with LPS and then immediately hit them with SPM, you blunt the inflammatory response. Um, and some of that signaling has been worked out, so they've been shown to inhibit NF-kappa B uh, signaling, so you dampen. Uh, obviously, TNF and then also the TLR4 response uh, is, is down regulated as well. So, um, yes. Yeah. No more questions. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.